Hey there, welcome to another episode of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and the part of my collection that I'm going to be talking about today are some of my Masters of the Universe Classics figures. So I started this channel um, a little more than a year ago now. I started it in uh, February of 2019. And back then I wasn't really sure what this channel was going to be, um, if I was just going to do toy reviews or lists, and uh, I, I didn't know. Anyway, um, I did come up with a bunch of lists for ideas for episodes, like my top 10 of this and my top 10 of that, my top 10 of this. Anyway, so I had a bunch of those lists ready, and I did some of them, but I didn't get to do all of them. One of the lists I did was back in episode uh, 23, um, almost a full year ago now, a little more than a year ago, because it was, it was April uh, 2019 that I did an episode titled um, The 15 Best Masters of the Universe Classics Figures Based on the Vintage Toy Line. So the Masters of the Universe Classics line is the, um, well, I was going to say the current Masters of the Universe line, but it actually, it just came to an end like last year. But it started um, essentially 2009 and ran till about 2019. And uh, so yeah, the Masters of the Universe Classics line has now come to an end. Uh, Mattel is going to launch a new series of He-Man figures, kind of based more on the vintage, kind of shorter, squattier figures. But um, So I liked Master of the Universe when I was a kid in the 80s, and I also liked it when it was revived back in 2002 with their kind of more stylized toy line, so I collected both of those. But um, I really became a hardcore Master of the Universe collector when the classic line came out, just because it was such an expansive line, it really gave me an opportunity to really expand my Master of the Universe collection. So I've got two uh, two pretty stacked bookshelves full of Master of the Universe classics figures over here. And so yeah, in the first episode um, I did, well that one back in April 2019, I was originally going to do the uh, like the top 10 Masters of the Universe classics figures. Um, but there's just so many great figures that I wanted to talk about. There's like, there's really hardly any duds in the whole line. So I, I expanded it to the top 15 and even then, I was like, I was leaving out so many cool figures. So I broke it up and I said, okay, I'll do the top 15 based on the vintage 80s toy line. So these were figures that we already got in the 80s. And how have they been improved? And how do the new classics figures stack up to the old vintage ones? So that's the episode I did. And there was always intended to be a part two where I would do the top 15 Masters of the Universe classics figures not based on the vintage toy line. Because the classics line draws from all kinds of sources. Largely, probably mostly, from the vintage toy line. But it also draws uh, ideas from the, uh, the mini comic books that used to come packaged with the toys. Um, from the, uh, the 80s cartoon. From the 2002 animated series and toy line. From, uh, uh, from comic books. From movies. From all over the place and some of them they just come up with brand new original ideas so there's lots of figures in the classics line that we never got in the vintage toy line and there's some really really cool ones so finally a year late i'm going to do part two of my best of master universe classics line so i'm going to start with number 15 and i'll work my way up to number one of what i think are the best kind of original characters first time characters in the Masters of the Universe Classic line. So in my number 15 spot, I've got Gygor the Gorilla Warrior. So this guy is quite big. So there he's got a cape with kind of this know, gorilla handprint and symbol on the back. But yeah, he's a big heavy figure. Lots of nice sculpted detail. And just so you can see how big he is compared to a standard Master Universe Classics figure. Here he is next to uh, Super 7's animated Skeletor. So yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit bigger. But yeah, so like I said, there's lots of great sculpted detail on this guy. He's very dusty. I apologize. I probably should have prepared for this a little bit better. I will say, like, I am not uh, claiming to be you know, an encyclopedic source for your Masters of the Universe background. So I apologize if I get the history of some of these figures wrong. Um, I didn't do any research before I jumped on here. I'm just kind of talking from memory. 
But yeah, so this guy here, he was released in 2010, so pretty early on in the Masters of the Universe Classics line. The armor here is removable, at least like the helmet is. I've never removed any other pieces of his armor, but you can see here the arm. The wrist guards, they slide around pretty easily. So I imagine the, you could probably get all this stuff off if you just wanted a big naked yellow gorilla. But uh, yeah, the head sculpt is really great. I love the sculpted teeth. And the colors for Gorilla are pretty weird, but uh, at the same time, they're pretty standard for, you know, Eternia, the world where all these characters live. Because if you remember Battle Cat from the original cartoon and original toy line, he was a tiger that was green with orange stripes or with yellow stripes. So that didn't make a whole lot of sense either. So why not a uh, lemon lime gorilla here? So yeah, I, uh, I can't even remember what other accessories this guy came with. I don't know if it was only the axe. He might have had a sword and other stuff as well. But again, this isn't really supposed to be a review of all these figures. This is just kind of me saying which guys I think are the coolest. And yeah, so Gygor is super cool. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people would place this much higher on a list like this. Um, it's just I am kind of a sucker for the more classic, you know, muscle man figure. Um, so even though Gygor is really neat, you know, he's almost more like a, a, a beast figure. Uh, I don't know if he is intended to be an intelligent character or what. But uh, the history of this guy, just quickly, is um, when the uh, people at Mattel were first designing the original wave of Masters of the Universe classics, or sorry, of the original Masters of the Universe, like vintage figures back in the 80s, um, when they were trying to expand on the toy line, they would take some figures from other toy lines. So you should really watch the episode of Masters of the Universe uh, the Toys That Made Us on Netflix, if you haven't watched it already. But they talk about uh, how they added Battle Cat. So what they did is they thought they needed some animals for the toy line, and they said, hey, we could take the tiger from our Big Jim toy line, and we could put that into the Masters of the Universe line. And they said, yeah, but the Big Jim figures are 12 inches tall. The Masters of the Universe guys are only like 5 and a half inches tall. This tiger is going to be way oversized. And they said, well, put a saddle on him and, you know, he can be a jumbo, you know, space tiger or whatever. And so that's what they did. So they took the tiger, which was an unarticulated, you know, regularly painted tiger from the big gym line, turned him into Battle Cat. They did the same thing with uh, Zor, who was like the, uh, the eagle character, who, you know, he was just a standard eagle in the big gym line. But they took him and they painted him bright colors for the Masters of the Universe line. And Gygor here was supposed to be the same thing because there was a gorilla in the uh, big gym line and he had these arms that when you rolled a little knob on his back the arms would flail around and they took that to the prototype stage where they painted it in like loud Eternian colors and they said this is a figure we could release Gygor the gorilla um, and to be honest I'm not even sure if he had the name associated with him at that point but uh, yeah it just never came to be so when the classics figures came out around 2008-2009 um, the designers had access to all of the old prototype drawings and concept sketches. And so they found uh, the Gygor concept and they ran with it. And they gave us this new Gygor figure. So really nicely articulated, totally original sculpt. You know, they couldn't borrow pieces from any other characters here. Um, you know, the cape is really nice. Everything really cool. Like this figure a lot. So that's why he is number 15. So at number 14, I've got this dude. Granamir the dragon and I will flip this around so I can show you him without me in the way but I just don't know if I'll be able to fit him on screen very well so I thought I'd show him to you this way first so you can get an idea of how big this guy is so this is like a standard Master of the Universe Classics figure so compared to Granamir you know he's really dwarfed by this guy so yeah this is a big figure um, he was quite a bit more expensive than the other figures. It's been a while since I bought this guy, but I think like the average figure was about 27 bucks. I think this guy was maybe close to 100 in the 75 to 100 range. Again, don't quote me on that. But yeah, really cool guy. And this is how he came in the package. I think he had to maybe attach his tail and maybe his wings. They were separated. But uh, yeah, he's kind of squatting like this because this is often how he was portrayed but he can actually stand 
well, I don't think he can actually stand with his own weight, but you can expand his legs. Um, and then he is substantially taller still. So yeah, again, compared to one of these little guys, yeah, this is a big figure. Okay, so now that you've got a, a sense of how big this guy is, I'm going to flip things around again. So here we have Granamir, and as I expected, with the way I have my uh, camera and everything set up, he is not going to fit on screen, but uh, yeah, he is a big, a big guy. So this guy, um, this figure came out in 2012, and he is based on the, uh, the vintage uh, Masters of the Universe cartoon from Filmation in the 80s. So... This guy appeared in a couple episodes, I believe. So he was this big red dragon with the helmet. Um, appeared in a couple episodes of the cartoon. It was probably too big a character for them to even consider making a toy of back in the 80s. But uh, the character also appeared in the mini comics. His design was a little different. He was brightly, he was like brightly green colored. Um, but he was still this kind of big pot-bellied dragon. And... Mattel actually re-released this figure in green, which also looks really nice. I'm a little hard-pressed to say which one I like better. Uh, I think I probably prefer the red, just because I had seen the cartoons as a kid, but I don't think I had the mini-comic that he appeared in, so I'm not, I wasn't really familiar with the green look. But as a toy, the green classics figure looks really nice. And uh, yeah, if this guy wasn't so damn expensive and didn't take up so much room, I probably would have considered getting the green one as well but I did not. So yeah, as it stands, I think uh, Granamere is a really cool figure. Another really nice addition to the collection. Uh, looks impressive on the shelf. But as I said, when looking at Gygor, he's just a little kind of outside the, the norm for Masters of the Universe. When you think of what a Masters of the Universe figure looks like, you picture kind of muscle man with a certain physique. So uh, because this guy is sort of so outside the standard wheelhouse for Masters of the Universe, that's what probably puts him a little lower on my list. So at number 13, I have Castle Grayskull Man. And this guy was released in 2012. So besides redoing uh, vintage characters, in 2012, uh, Mattel was a couple of years into the classics line now. And they decided to expand it with this kind of toy line within a toy line. And so they called it the Masters of the Universe 30th Anniversary um, wave of figures there were six figures and basically it was they were going to do be all original characters so these characters had no previous history in the master of the universe lore and they got different people um, some famous people to design these characters and uh, one of the characters that came out in the line was this character called the fearless photog and i can actually show him to you so this is the Fearless Photog. He's got a camera for a head and a camera for a gun. Um, and he's got this weird lenticular sticker on his chest. So you can see this guy running across. Like it's, it's pretty silly. Even in a line full of silly characters. He's got these film reels on his belt. Anyway, so this character here, he's got an interesting history. In that in the 80s, Mattel did... A contest where fans could create a character and the winner would get their character created into an actual toy and put into the Masters of the Universe toy line. So some kid designed this character, the Fearless Photog, uh, and so this was the winning choice. However, for whatever reason, maybe because Masters of the Universe toy line was kind of already, you know, on the outs, it wasn't as popular anymore, Fearless Photog never got made. So I'm sure that kid probably got something, a cash prize or something maybe, but he never got to see his creation in plastic. So when this line started, not only did the four horsemen, who were the uh, the sculpting team that worked for Mattel, not only did they come up with a nice version of Fearless Photog, that fan-made character, but they ran another contest and they said, okay, so we've finally got Fearless Photog made 30 years too late. But uh, here's another contest. So we're going to let fans create another character. And there was a whole bunch of submissions. And the winning choice was Castle Grayskull Man. And fortunately, the guy that created this guy, which was some dude named Daniel Benedict, he didn't have to wait 30 years to see his creation in plastic. They got Castle Grayskull Man made right away. So I'll be honest. I was a little reluctant to put him on my list because I do think he's, 
he's cool, but he's kind of stupid at the same time. Like, he looks like Castle Grayskull. Like, his face has got that, uh, you know, famous uh, jaw bridge and everything. Like, that's what Castle Grayskull looks like. And then his body, with it's got the green brick um, kind of built into it. The boots, you know, green, they look like turrets on a castle with that ledge there. Like, it's a really kind of fun design. But then they gave him this long blonde hair, which I think kind of ruins it and makes him extra campy. Like, I can kind of buy into the concept. They gave him some sort of backstory about, um, in a time of great need, the sorceress or whatever empowered Castle Grayskull to come to life and help fight or something. But uh, if this guy was to, like, walk out of the walls of Castle Grayskull as some, like, golem or something, I could, I could buy into that. But then why the long blonde hair? That just seems corny. But if that's what Daniel designed on his original sketch, then I guess that's what Mattel had to go with. So I do think this guy's kind of silly, but kind of awesome at the same time. And I do think it's pretty cool that a fan created this guy and got to see him come to life. So yeah, this guy was not from, you know, any previous cartoons or any previous comic books. He was a totally original character, as was the case with all of the 30th anniversary figures from 2012. In my number 12 spot, I've got the Palace Guards, and these guys were released in 2011. Now, this might be kind of a cheat to put two characters uh, in one slot, but uh, it's my list, and it's not the last time I'm going to do it, so whatever. So the Palace Guards, these are the guys that work at Castle Grayskull, and, uh, or maybe not even Castle Grayskull, they work at the King Randor's Palace. And uh, they work for Man-at-Arms, who was the leader of the army. So... We're all familiar with Man-at-Arms. He's one of the main characters from Masters of the Universe in this green suit with the orange armor. And in the vintage cartoons, they always showed he had like troopers that wore similar armor kind of running around backing him up. And uh, we never had figures of those guys. And so Mattel finally gave us that in 2011. So these guys came in a two-pack together. And you see, I've got them displayed with the same uh, kind of long axe and shield. But there were options. They came with a bunch of weapons. So if you wanted this guy to have a sword and this guy to have a spear, um, they're actually storing some of the weapons on their back. They have two clips here so they can store two weapons each. So I've got him with a little axe. I've got him with a little mace. And uh, they also came with four heads, which is really cool. So they came with two human heads. So they came with a white guy and an African-American guy. And then they came with these two kind of monster faces. So we got a lizardy guy and a cat guy. And besides that, you'll notice on the helmet, there's these kind of like peg holes on each side. So they actually came with kind of a face mask that you could put across. You could only see their eyes if you had the, the mask on there. And I probably should have dug it out for this video, but I, I didn't. Um, but anyway, that gave you a whole lot of options. So you could buy this two pack, like basically four times. And you could have the two human heads and the two creature heads. And then you could buy them. You could get them again with the uh, masks covering their mouth and nose. You could change their weapons. So it really allowed people to build armies if they wanted to do that. So if you have a Castle Grayskull on display and you wanted to have these guys all stand in front of it, um, yeah, you could do that. Um, another way you could change them up is these chest plates. I think they came with four, maybe even maybe even more than that. But these chest plates are removable. So he's got the eagle one. This guy's got the battle damage. But you could find one that's got like two slashes of battle damage uh, and different logos. So again, really cool. Also, the armor here is removable. So if you want to take this guy's shoulder armor off, maybe you only have, have armor on one arm. Like There's ways to diversify these guys. And it was just a really cool idea. And uh, yeah, since I only bought the pack once, I chose to display them with the creature heads just because I really love these faces. The, uh, the lizard guy and then the, uh, the cat guy here. Yeah, really cool designs. And uh, a really kind of easy toy to make because it just allowed them to reuse basically the man arm figure that they had already produced, throw some extra heads and some extra weapons in there, and then you've got this really cool two-pack that people are going to buy multiple copies of. So yeah, very cool. So in my number 11 spot, I've got Keldor. So let's take a closer look at him. So you see here he's got kind of a smarmy face with this little smirk, with this long little goatee, little mustache long black flowing hair and yeah you might be thinking this guy looks kind of familiar and that's because this is supposed to be Skeletor before he became Skeletor and so the origins of this guy is that back in the mini comic books that came with the vintage figures 
there was a reference to King Randor, He-Man's father, having a brother named Keldor, but they didn't really delve into it any deeper than that. Then in the 2002 cartoon, they expanded on that storyline and they said, Keldor, uh, so not only did he look like this, so he was Randor's brother, but through some, like, I think it was some, you know, spell he tried to put together gone wrong, he basically melted his face up and became disfigured and became Skeletor. So even though, yes, we had a Skeletor figure in the vintage toy line, we never had Keldor, his, uh, his pre-Skeletor identity. And this is another figure that was really easy to create, kind of like the palace guards, in that they could just take the existing Skeletor figure they'd already made and plop this new uh, Keldor head on there. But they didn't do that. They made a couple other little simple changes, such as giving him human hands, because the Skeletor figure has got like clawed hands, but this guy's got normal human ones. And where Skeletor has kind of like clawed feet, this guy's got kind of just normal boots on, like He-Man or man arms would have. So he's got some more human features to him as well. The costume is, uh, is, is very similar to Skeletor's, but not quite the same. So it does differentiate him. And I think it's just a really cool figure to have. Uh, we actually did get a Keldor figure in the 2002 line. Uh, it was actually just a, a special like San Diego Comic-Con exclusive version of Skeletor that came with an alternate uh, Keldor head that you could place on him. And I thought that figure was really cool, and I wanted that, but because it was a San Diego exclusive, it was kind of expensive. So I was never able to get that 2002 Keldor. So yeah, I was pretty happy when Mattel revisited that idea in their Classics line. So yeah, no Keldor in the Vintage toy line, and uh, yeah, definitely a highlight of the Classics line. So in my number 10 spot, I've got what they call Battleground Evil Lin. So this figure was released in 2011. So, you see here, Eva Lynn is not wearing her helmet, which I think is just really cool looking, and it's a different look for the character. Because, uh, you know, in the vintage cartoons, Eva Lynn, um, she had kind of pale skin, and she had this purple costume, but for whatever reason, the vintage toy had this bright yellow skin and blue outfit. The two just never really lined up. So when the classics line started... They put out a figure that was based on the vintage toy with the yellow skin and the blue outfit. And I really like this figure. Uh, you know, I think it's it's great. But I really liked what they did with her in the 2002 line in that they took her classic kind of cartoon look and just, you know, amped it up and made it look a lot cooler. And there was an episode of the 2002 cartoon where she actually took her helmet off. And we saw that she had this kind of like white haired pixie cut, which I thought was really great. I liked it a lot. And so with this figure here, when they re-released this uh, Evelyn, they gave it in the kind of vintage cartoon colors or the more, the more kind of standard human looking colors. But with some extra flair, they gave her a cape here and uh, some different accessories and an alternate head. So she actually does have a head with the helmet on. But I've chosen to display her with the uh, without the helmet because I already have this version with the helmet, and yeah, I just think this is a really great look. So yes, we had an Evelyn in the vintage line, but it was based on this look. So as far as battleground Evelyn goes, I think it's a uh, a superior look, and I like having the options, and yeah, just a really really great figure. I love it. In my number nine spot, I've got battleground Tila. So kind of the same idea. We had a Tila in the vintage toy line. And when they revisited that toy in the classics line, the classics figure was based on the vintage toy with the red hair and the familiar outfit, kind of the white bathing suit look. But um, in the early years of Masters of the Universe Classic, there was a lot of things, there was a lot of uh, kind of inconsistencies between the way it was presented in the cartoons or in the mini comics. And besides the mini comics that came with the toys, DC Comics actually did publish a mini series on Masters of the Universe very early on as well, before the kind of the whole continuity and the storyline was established. And this is what Tila looked like in the original comic books. She had this like long flowing blonde hair and this kind of just like bikini style armor. And yeah, it's a really cool look. And I like that Mattel gave us this variant. I love the classic Tila, and if I had to choose one or the other, I would probably go with the classic redhead Tila. But yeah, this makes for a really cool figure. 
And yeah, if I had both these toys as a kid, I would probably just use her as an alternate alternate character altogether. But I think the sculpting on it is really nice, and it's a nice nod to an oft-forgotten part of Masters of the Universe history. In my number eight spot, I've got Icer. This figure came out in 2013, and I absolutely love it. It made my uh, top ten list that year. And you can see here, he's got kind of a, he's sculpted in kind of a translucent blue. So he's kind of see-through in areas, but then he's got this kind of white, uh, kind of speckled paint wash over top of him. So it really does give him this kind of appearance like he's made of ice, and it's just really cool. For accessories, so he's got this trident here or whatever, but I really like that he's got this big giant icicle that's kind of the same thing. It's sculpted out of clear blue plastic with the white highlights. Just looks really great. It's such a kind of silly design. Like, why would a guy made of ice have to wear... I don't know, this, it's not even a hood, it's just the, the collar of a hood, the trim. Uh, you know, it's silly, um, but it's silly in all the right ways. So this character first appeared in the vintage cartoon, and they had so many characters in the old cartoon that were just in one episode. Sometimes, just to get away from Skeletor, He-Man would fight these random enemies. Sometimes they were just little creatures he would encounter on his way to fight Skeletor. There was just lots of little one-off characters like this. And so that's where Icer comes from, from just one uh, kind of random episode of the cartoon. And I'll be honest, I watched the cartoons as a kid, but I have not revisited them. I've seen a few episodes, but I am by no means super familiar, or do I remember all the specifics of the cartoon. I don't really remember Icer from the cartoon, but I absolutely love the look of this guy. And yeah, that's why he's so high up on my list at number eight. In my number seven spot, I've got dial -a mug So like Icer, this is a character that appeared in the vintage cartoons, um, but we never got a toy of him in the vintage toy line. So fans of this character have been waiting decades to finally get a figure of him. And Super 7, who took over the classics license from Mattel, um, they put out this figure in 2018, and I think it is phenomenal. Um, it kind of goes against my rule where I said... I mostly prefer the big muscle men when it comes to He-Man. And this guy is definitely different looking. It's, uh, you know, they, they couldn't reuse any parts from previous figures for this guy. He's totally original. And uh, I just think he's awesome. So I guess that's why I put him up so high on my list. I think he's just really cool. Like on the top there, you see he's got all these like kind of exposed circuits in this clear plastic. It looks like something you would see on a circuit board. Just really great. He had lots of ways to um, to kind of change up his look. So this thing here, there was three or f I think three different logos that you could pop this out and plug in a different thing if you would if you rather. But the greatest thing about this figure, oh, I'm gonna get that back in it, is that you can change his expressions. He kind of works the way Manny faces worked in the vintage toy line. So in Manny faces, you could spin his face and he had three different faces. But with dial mug you can spin these three different things. So you can go from a frown to a sneer to a surprised look, smiling. Uh, the nose, I think, stays put, but the eyes change. So you can give them... Uh, this goes from a surprised smile or happy smile to a mean smile once you change the eyes. You know, so by spinning his eyes around, you can really ch kind of change the look of them. And it's just a, a really cool feature that takes me back to the vintage toy line. Most of the classic figures didn't have the same uh, play features as the vintage figures did. They tried to recreate them. For example, like Mecha Neck, in the old figure, you switched a button on his neck and his neck extended. They didn't do that in the classics figures. What they did is they had a, you took, you had to pop his head off and add an extra part to extend his neck. So it was still cool, but it just wasn't as quick and as fun as the vintage one. So I think that's one of my favorite things about this figure is that it has a play feature that's right there. It's quick and easy to use. Doesn't require you to keep extra pieces on hand. It's just just a really fun toy. In my number six spot, I've got another big figure. Let me bring a Skeletor back in here for scale yet again. So here's Skeletor, the standard like six inch figure. And then I've got Procrustus, who is the giant scale figure. And so he stands about 12 inches tall. And there was uh, a couple of giant figures in the Master Universe Classics line, uh, at least three of them. And Procrustus is by far my favorite. So Procrustus here is supposed to be a big, like kind of a god character. 
He only ever appeared in the mini comics that came with the vintage toys. And he only ever appeared in like two pages, I believe. Um, but basically what the storyline for him was is that he's this old god that lives in the center of the planet. And using his four arms, he holds the planet together. And uh, yeah, so he's supposed to be this kind of earthy rock character. And yeah, I think he just looks fantastic. As a fan of movies like Clash of the Titans and stuff, I always liked the idea of these big kind of stone statues come to life. And I think they've really done a good job of capturing that look here on Procrustis. Um, like you see his loincloth there. It looks like it's made of stone. Just really cool. And that beard. Come on, that's epic. Love this dude. So here is another two-pack that I have put in my number five spot. And this is, I think they were just called Snake Men. So the Snake Men are another faction uh, that He-Man fought in the classic Masters of the Universe lore, he basically had three enemies. Uh, there was Skeletor and his evil warriors, there was King Hiss and his snake men, and then there was Hordak and the evil Horde. Although in the vintage days, Hordak was mostly reserved to fight He-Man's sister, She-Ra. So when the 2002 cartoon came back, they really kind of delved into the snake men a little bit more. So he battled Skeletor throughout season one, the Snake Men Season 2, and Season 3 was supposed to be Hordak, but unfortunately we never got that far. But yeah, so in the 2002 cartoon, not only did we get all the classic Snake Men that we knew from the vintage toy line, so the name characters like Ratlore and Squeeze and King Hiss, um, but we also got these you know, snake armies that followed behind King Hiss. And so these figures here gave us you know, an, an opportunity to fill out our snake men ranks. So, you know, we already had all the individual snake men, but uh, this here, like the palace guards, was a two-pack that gave us some variety. So there was, a, I think, it, four heads, again, possibly even more than that. But yeah, so four heads, and they were all quite different. Different weapons. You could change up the armor on these guys. So if you bought this pack twice and you wanted to put this armor on the orange guy and this armor on the yellow guy and then change up their heads... You know, give them different weapons. It was just really cool to have so many options and to really expand your snake army. And uh, these heads here were my two favorites. So these are the ones that I've chosen to display them as. I think they're both really great. They've got a lot of personality. They don't look like any of the other snake men in my army. So uh, yeah, awesome figures both. And uh, the fact that you could, you know, expand on these and make even more characters just makes this this set that much cooler. So yeah, this is definitely a highlight of the whole Master of the Universe Classics line for me. The fact that you can take a couple of nobodies and turn them into some of my favorite figures in the whole line, I think is just really great. So yeah, these guys are awesome. In my number four spot, I have Batros, released in 2013. So this guy here, like Icer and Dialamug, this guy is from the vintage cartoon. And more like Icer than Dialamug, I think. Because Dialamug appeared regularly, whereas Batros is kind of just like a one-off guy. And, uh, yeah, I think this is a great figure. Like, he he just looks like a filmation cartoon. Like, he looks like he just left right off of the animation cell. And even though I don't really remember the episode he was from, I just, like, adore the look of this guy. He looks like he could have been on like a Scooby-Doo episode or something. He just has that kind of Hanna-Barbera-esque look about him. And he's just got a really fun design. He's kind of Dracula, kind of Batman, and kind of barbarian and just kind of a goofball. And I, I love these kind of goofy, weird villains. Um, there was another guy, kind of a vulture-themed guy named Voltak, who was also a lot of fun, but uh, Batros edges him out. And yeah, I just think Batros is great. I love this head sculpt with the textured fur. Like, it's hard to understand. Is this guy a bat guy? Or did he kill a giant bat and just skin him? And he's wearing the bat, like, skin as a cowl. And yet he has actual bat wings. Uh, like, I don't know. He's just, he's a weird guy to understand. Kind of like Icer. The design is just kind of goofy. But I just, I really dig it. So yeah, Batros, love him. Number four. So in my number three spot, I've got... Calyx. This figure came out in 2015. And this guy, he wasn't based on the vintage 
cartoon, but he was based on the 2002 cartoon, which makes him kind of a rarity in the classics line. Because they didn't often uh, delve into the 2002 mythos. It was mostly the vintage stuff they focused on. So when you got a character like this, who only ever appeared in the 2002 cartoon, it was a real treat to get a figure of him in the classics line. Now Calix here, you can probably tell from his logo on his chest and on his belt buckle that he is a member of the evil horde so he works for hordak now i mentioned we never got to hordak in the uh 2002 cartoon but we did get a little flashback um that was kind of leading up to the horde returning to eternia and in that little flashback we met this character and i think he was actually he got destroyed so he was only around for a couple of minutes if memory serves but uh, he looks really cool, and this figure just looks awesome. Like, I love this design. So speaking of Procrustus, about how I like his rocky design, I think this guy here pulls it off even better. Like, he looks like stone come to life. And uh, just, even though the paint is, work is really simple and there's not a whole lot to him, I think he just pulls it off brilliantly. Especially by contrast, fans of, uh, like, longtime fans might remember that even in the vintage line, there were some rock-based characters, and uh, they were called like Stonedar and Rockon. And we actually did get new versions of those guys in the Classics line. So here's one of them. And like, look at this goofball. So he's this dude, brightly colored, silver face, looks super cheesy. And he's got all these big, junky pieces on the back. And he basically folds up to look like a rock, so he can disguise himself as a rock. It's really corny. This guy here, this is a rock lord done right. If the rock guys had looked like this in the 80s, these guys would have been fan favorite characters, I'm sure. Instead, we got these dorks, and I'm glad we got this guy now. Because, yeah, he looks great. That rock beard and everything. Super, super cool. In my number two spot, I've got another original creation. So this guy was not from any comic books or cartoons previously. But this is Fangor. So he is another Snake Man, released in 2018 by Super 7. And uh, yeah, this guy, I think, has just got a really cool design. So he came with a bunch of accessories. Um, he's supposed to be like a mechanic or something, I think. He came with all these tools. He's also got this big sword. And then he's got this cool little winged snake mascot that rests on his shoulders. So really cool there. But this design, like look at that head with those big giant teeth. And he actually came with an alternate head with the teeth were only about half as long there. So if you don't like this look with the big crazy teeth, you could, you could change it up if you wanted to. But uh, what I like about this figure, not only is the design really great, and it also fits in perfectly with the existing Snake Men, is that you can imagine if this guy had existed in the vintage toy line, what his play feature would have been. He would have had these little teeth that came up to here, and then he would like roll a button on his back, and then these big long teeth would pop right out. So I can totally imagine that. So it's totally in the spirit of the vintage toy line. And uh, yeah, I just think this design is really great looking. I think he might be the coolest looking of all the Snake Men we've got. Just uh, really, really like it. The color palette works really well together. Yeah, so Fangor was uh, one of Super 7's best figures. And in my number one spot, I've got Drago Man, released in 2012. And he was part of the 30th anniversary line of all original characters. And this guy was created by the Four Horsemen. So those were the guys that sculpted all the figures. But the other characters in the 30th line were like designed by other people and then sculpted by the Four Horsemen. But in the case of Drago Man, the Four Horsemen came up with the concept and sculpted them. And it's obvious because the Four Horsemen know what they're doing. And this figure is just wicked. And he was the same price as any other standard Master of the Universe character. But, like, you get these big leathery dragon wings. This t big tail. Like, he was just bursting out of the package when you got him. And I just think he looks awesome. Like, look at the sculpt on this head. Got these horns here. The sword. He's got this flaming sword sculpted in translucent plastic. The colors look great. The red skin, the purple armor, the orange highlights. Just all in all, a really, really cool figure. Like, if you're a collector of fantasy-based figures, whether you like Masters of the Universe or not, 
this guy is a must-have for your collection. Like, he could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Mythic Legions figures, you know, anything out of Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, anything like that. This guy is just an awesome-looking toy. And, uh, yeah, it's hands down my number one spot for uh, original characters in this toy line. Okay, so that is my list of the top 15 Masters of the Universe Classics figures not based on the vintage Masters of the Universe toy line. So I know I left a lot of cool figures off of there. Um, my videos don't typically generate a ton of comments, but I do remember when I posted that Masters of the Universe one uh, a year ago, it generated a few and people were saying, you forgot Trapjaw, how could you not put Trapjaw on the list? I'm aware that, like I said, there's probably 200 Masters of the Universe classics over here. And there's maybe, I don't, for one, I don't buy the ones I don't like. So I've only bought the 200 or so that I like. And of them, maybe 10 of them have been kind of disappointments and didn't live up to my expectations. So there's a lot of cool figures. It was very hard to get a list of just 30 or two different lists of 15. So uh, yeah, if you disagree with me, it's, it's not that I think your favorite figure sucks. It's just, uh, yeah, a list is only so long. But I am curious to hear who you think um, should have been on the list. So if you like a figure not from the vintage toy line that you think should have been on this list here, please uh, let me know in the comments. I'm always curious. And uh, yeah, even if you don't have, uh, even if you totally agree with my list, please feel free to leave me comments below. I always appreciate it. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, all that jazz. So uh, yeah, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Ciao.